talking before the panel, kind of preparing for this conversation, I was thinking about, especially being, I guess you could call like a next generation, I guess I still count as next generation. I'm kind of on the cusp of the Y and X thing. Uh, I was thinking about what I really want from my teachers, what I really want from the traditions I'm part of. I was thinking like, what do I need? And that's what I would bring to this conversation, just to throw it out there, um, hoping that it's reflective of other people's experiences. So one thing I thought of that doesn't get talked a, a whole lot about is I actually need resources. I need support. I need connections. You know, I have this Buddhist Geeks project. It, it, it's so amazing. Every time someone offers something, uh, some sort of gift, it's, it's, it just feels so great to have that. And in the same way, I know that uh, in order to really practice well and to understand these teachings, like I, I just felt like I really need support. Um, and I wanted to just throw that out there as uh, something I know we talk about. I, I definitely have support when I come on retreats, etc. But how else mm -hmm. does this generation that's coming up get support um, from our elders, from the people who've spent so much time you know, exploring these things themselves? Like what's What's the best way to, to get that information, you know, to, to get it transmitted? Um, is there an app for that? I'm wondering, like the Elder <laughs> Buddhism app. <laughs> we do have an Inside LA app. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so anyway, just, just a, a question, really. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody want to respond? About resources? And support. I mean, I th it feels to me that um, that I've noticed certain teachers, for instance, like Jack Kornfield and Judy Goodman in the pioneer generation who are really making an effort to offer resources to the people of the younger generations and upcoming teachers and practitioners. I'm also sort of in a bridge generation. And, um, and, I, and I think that they're out there. And it's something, it's sort of what Ethan was saying, people have to actually come and go and use it. And so part of it is the, re is the resources are there, but will people come? Will they, will they make the effort? So I think there's tons of resources out there. And you can still go practice in Asia. You can, I mean, there's, there's a bit of a glorification around the, um, these first generation teachers who went and did all their practice in Asia. Well, keep going. Go. Why, why not? So, um, so that w the wealth of the ancient traditions is there. The wealth, we actually, I think we're really lucky. I think that my generation, upcoming generation, is incredibly lucky by the incredible amount of, of teachings and resources that exist, whether, obviously, we're not going to get our answers through Wikipedia, but um, we might get some. I don't know. Well, I, I do think, which I, I think I was trying to allude to earlier, that in terms of resources, the, the, the main thing that people are, are looking for, um, I think, is two things. Um, people want to hang out with other people. Mm. Um, and especially, I think there's a, there's a superficial aspect to that, too, which is people want to hang out with other people they're interested in and attracted to and can get their regular community resources. So, you know, like for, I remember when I <clears throat> first started taking um, classes at the New York Shambhala Center when I was 17, and I was the, the youngest person in the class of 15 people by literally 20 years, which that's changed a lot in the last 15 or 16 years, but that was the way it was. And I just said, this is not where I'm gonna talk about a tribe called Quest. This is not going to happen here. So you had to divide your regular community resources from your Dharma community resources. And I think the, the more that um, uh, people, people have Sangha, that they can actually get both of their sort of regular resources and their Dharma resources from, it's, it's more integrated. And then the other thing I think in terms of resources is, you know, it's different in different communities, but what I hear reported all the time is, it's not hard to find a teacher in the sense of like a teacher's books, but a teacher whose class you can go to every week or you can check, have a one-on-one -on -one time with every month. For most people I talk to, especially if they don't live in one of these few cosmopolitan centers with a lot of, of um, Buddhist centers, like New York, oddly, has kind of become like a mecca for Buddhism and the Bay Area and here 
if you don't live in one of those places, it's very hard to find, you know, what we would call Kalyanamita or Kalyanamitra, you know, like a spiritual mentor. And so I think we are, and I think there's still some, I noticed this because I work with um, some Buddhist teachers and have a strong interest in Western psychology, you know, as well, that we're still at this point where we don't really know what a Dharma teacher is as a livelihood model. Mm -hmm. So those resources are still kind of lagging behind and meanwhile the psychotherapists are saying well if you guys you know the cognitive behavioral therapy for example is saying if you guys don't want to use this stuff we'll we'll take it and charge a lot of money for it and we can make a living off of it so um, <laughs> and um, so I think it's still this in-between phase where we're not sure what the model for the teacher resource actually is yeah and and also uh, I think Dharma communities eventually hopefully will become complete communities where you know your uh, all of your interests also um, uh, are included in your Dharma community interests could I could I res kind of yes. respond to yes. the Diana's point because I, I think yeah. you're right that they're in my experience the resources are there and I've certainly been one to kind of go out and get them mm -hmm. or find them um, but then it's kind of like the analogy I think of is like, okay, we have plenty of food to feed people, but then how are resources allocated? Mm -hmm. um, and that's where I feel like there's this sort of generational divide. And I, mm. I've talked a lot about this with friends like Rohan, and I don't think it's any fault of any particular people in the generation. It just seems like we're in a time where things are changing so rapidly with technology that the divides are, between generations are actually getting bigger. So like mm -hmm. when I grew up, you know, it's completely immersed in the digital world and then I go to retreats there's an expectation that everything is going to be physical uh, completely physical mm -hmm. um, like I can't really get access to someone unless it's physically uh, for the most part and so it, it's this feeling and, I, and I've kind of reflected with friends of mine that it's difficult to get those resources in the ways that we naturally find them not to say that we want the, dar the internet to be our dharma mm -hmm. teacher but rather why can't I Skype with some of my Dharma teachers occasionally? Or why, you know, there, there's a way in which the resources are set up uh, differently from generation to generation. Mm -hmm. And that there's this sort of gap that's very difficult to traverse, I've found, um, which is part of the reason I, I suspect that there aren't a lot of uh, you know, younger people statistically that are getting into Buddhism right now. Um, so anyway, I just want to throw that out there as a kind of counterpoint. And, and my experience has been that that's changing, but it still feels like a painful divide, at least from where I'm sitting. Yeah, I, th I think um, for me, it, coming from a different generation, mm -hmm. that I feel that divide as well, and I don't even know quite how to bridge it. Mm -hmm. um, but I don't think that people aren't coming in. There was a conference that you were at that's kind of a sister or brother conference to this of Wisdom 2.0 in Silicon Valley last February. Some of you might have been there. And there were about 400 people or 450 people that were part of it and the panels included some of the founders of Facebook or Zynga or some really key players in the, in the Valley. Um, but the interesting part for me is that it was live streamed and there were 250,000 people watching it online. Um, and when somebody, I think it was Sharon Salzberg asked how many people in the room had a yoga or meditation or some form of dharma practice, the majority of hands went up. And it was partly self-selected, that's the people who came, but it somehow gave a sense to me that actually there was a tremendous amount of interest and in a new language, what you're doing, what Ethan's doing, that there's some way in which you are using a whole new culture and language that isn't part of my generation, really, and speaking that language. So I feel like it's happening, in a, I'm a little bit at a remove, not out of lack of wanting to do it, but partly because it's not my language. Right. Um, Wish you could just learn C++ and we could well, speak it? the same language. <laughs> it's Come on, little, Jack. It's, it's funny. I mean, it's a little my language. I was at Dartmouth when BASIC was invented, you know, and learned <laughs> back, which is sort of like chiseling in Mesopotamia or something like that. And also, funny, um, one of the ways I, I, when I dropped out of college, um, I worked at Harvard Business School running the first really big computer they got, which was an IBM 1401 that now would fit in one part of your wristwatch or something. And you, you want to know what Harvard Business School did with that big computer that we were working, programming, doing stuff with? 
think market analysis, commodities trading, things like that. You know what their first big project was? Alumni giving. <laughs> so, I mean, they know where money comes from. And you talk about resources, they were interested in how they were being supported. So I want to throw it back on you. What kind of support do, can you envision what you want coming from, whether it's Asian generation teachers that Diana talked about, or previous you know, pioneer generations, what are you looking for? I do want to point out you do have an iPad sitting on your lap. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> it's not completely. Yeah. But, but I think it's an iPad 1. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> True, I've been hankering after the iPad too, but <laughs> yeah, that's a good question, and, and part of what I'm realizing, even talking about this, is that some of the resources that I've noticed are needed are not ones that it's even fair to ask. But uh, ask that anyway. I think it's interesting. Yeah, but like some of them, I think, have to do with technology or support with, uh, you know, like how do you get people to support you in building websites and building you know, community, types of community projects that are, you know, I'm sure the ID project works a lot mm -hmm. with this. Like, how do you build such a robust online uh, kind of overlay on what's basically a in-person community? And those mm -hmm. things, um, it's, of course, I'm not coming to you guys to ask you how to build those type of things. Good thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> well, I'll tell you uh, how, I mean, we've been fortunate to have, I don't know if he's here yet, Alan Weiss our resident Buddhist geek, um, he will be here. And the way that we were able to have that support was, I think, one word, ask. I asked. At the end of a retreat, I was desperate. You know, I was I owed another $2,000 to the web guy for just doing simple things, and I just asked. So some of it has to do with, I think, being willing to this is what is happening and this is what we need to keep it happening. Mm. And some of the pioneer teachers are here, Shinzen, Ken, who are really paying attention mm. to this, especially mm. Shinzen is doing some pioneering things mm. with teaching on the internet. Um, but I think too, uh, coming back to what Ethan was saying about, yes, people want to hang out with each other, but they want to hang out with each other in a place where what they care about is uh, central and relevant. And so I think we are now addressing questions like money and sexuality and uh, work and kids and family and real life everyday questions, how to balance our lives, ongoing question for all of us, especially overworked Dharma teachers. And and this is different, really different, from when we were learning from our teachers. I didn't go to Asia, but I studied with the Asian teachers. And we used to ask them for advice about our relationships. You know, we forgot these. I remember my first teacher, he was a Korean celibate monk. And you know, people would go to him and say, I don't know what to do about my marriage. And he would say, well, go on a three-month retreat and do a thousand prostrations every day. <laughs> and when you come back, your mind will be clear and it will be fine. <laughs> that was his best advice. But I mean, we were working with people who didn't have the, they hadn't been out in the world, had a job, um, been in a relationship and um, had to deal with money in the ways that we all do. Do you feel like, uh, do you notice any similar types of gaps? Like with your younger students, do you notice the things that are like difficult to relate to or that like you notice you're kind of at cross, like you're just not hitting when you talk to them? Just wondering if there's anything similar going on now. I mean, maybe not you guys, you're pretty integrated. I, yeah, but it's <laughs> hard the to world, tell. But. It's hard because to tell. You would know. There's, there's a gap. They don't say. They don't say. You, <laughs> you're really irrelevant. No. <laughs> <laughs> they don't tell us. They go and talk to the people that are. <laughs> I think you. Know, <laughs> I rely on the fact that suffering is suffering. You know, if people are hurting and they want to be free of that and they want to find ways 
to love and be loved and grow their capacity to love and care and live harmoniously. With, I, to me, this is pretty universal. I think where I feel the gap, and I don't know if you do, you know, maybe on the receiving end, is some of the metaphors that mm -hmm. I might use. Uh, finding the right metaphor that matches and maps onto enough of what you already know to be meaningful and connect you, while also then being able to draw into the unknown and um, what needs to be learned. That's an area that I feel it sometimes, if that makes sense. I also think in terms of uh, teaching, you know, I, I think that's the very subtle thing is that people, in terms of relevance or irrelevance, you're, you're never actually going to know. The, the way you're going to know is if you're relevant is if people show up again. That's, <laughs> that's the, the main way that, I mean, nobody, you're absolutely right, nobody talks about irrelevance. They just fade away. They vote with their feet. Right, exactly. Um, or their sits bones in this case. Um, <laughs> But I, I think with teaching, I, I definitely experience that a lot. A lot of times, as a um, as a young younger student, that there was just culture metaphors or cultural references or lifestyle references that not only it, it wasn't that they weren't um, relevant to me; it's that they were very narrow. You know, so somebody would just talk about their their nine to five job, but wouldn't be able to reference global politics or wouldn't be able to reference art or wouldn't be able to reference television and I think you know I always try as best I can when teaching to have multiple cultural reference points in each talk that might correspond to different people's experience not just to be like ooh he you know he saw the wire or something like that not just to be cool that way but to actually I think we're trying to transmit because I think one of the biases people have uh, about Dharma is this is a way that you subtly remove yourself from the world. And the more we know about different aspects mm -hmm. of culture and what's going on in the world right now and can thread different cultural mm -hmm. references each time we give a presentation, um, the more we say to people on a very subtle subliminal level, this is somebody who's really curious and engaged about what's going on in the world right now and their practice is, is actually lets them know more about the world rather than just their narrow cultural um, strand of it. So I think that's, that's very important for teachers to work on really having a broad sense of what's going on in the news, even, even when you know, it's annoying politically, et cetera, but, and, and what's going on culturally so that we can draw on multiple perspectives and at least transmit to students, this is somebody who's really engaged in the world, because that's interesting to people. And I, oh, go ahead. No, I was going to say, I think this speaks to not just the age gap, but also, um, will you reference it a little bit, but different cultures that when we're speaking from a predominantly, uh, let's say I as a white person, am I, speak, am I making references that people of other races, of other gender identities, sexual identity, you know, all of that needs to be included as well. And I think that when you look at, when I look at the changes that have happened in the last 20 years since I started my own Dharma practice, I think there's much more awareness now than there was certainly 20 years ago of these issues and that they're include, there's, I think teachers are a bit hipper. I won't say um, to this kind of thing. I won't say that that goes for all Dharma teachers at all, but, but, there's, but that's part of it. There's more an awareness of inclusivity, exclusivity, and how to bring that in. And I'm, I'm really happy to see that. That's a huge change that's happened since I first started.